Hi, I'm Abby. I'm Amy. And I'm Emma. You're listening to a clip from the Read It Forward podcast. And if you'd like to hear more, you can find us at readitforward.com slash podcast or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Enjoy. We're here with Fiona Davis, who I like to consider a historical fiction wizard of sorts. Ooh, I like that. (laughs) I have loved your two previous books, The Dollhouse and The Address. And you have a new book coming out. Tell us a little bit about what that's about. Sure. So it's called The Masterpiece, and it's set at Grand Central Terminal. And as I was researching, I learned that there was an art school there that was founded by John Singer Sargent in the 1920s. And it was there for 20 years. It had 900 students a year. And I thought, what a perfect setting. So part of the book takes place in the jazz age from the point of view of this female artist who's a faculty member and is really trying to make her way in a world that is, you know, filled with men artists. And then the other part of the book takes place in 1974. And that's when the city was almost bankrupt. Grand Central was almost about to be demolished. And it tells, from the point of view of this Upper East Side socialite who's fallen on hard times and has to take a job in the info booth, which is right in the middle of the concourse. Mm. And she discovers this abandoned art school and starts digging into the mystery of what happened. I love in your fiction that we get often two different time periods. And there's always someone digging around (laughs) and sort of finding clues from the past that actually inform their life. I loved that in the address when we flash forward to the 80s and antagonist in the 80s is finding things in a trunk that sort of illuminate this past life. So that book, The Address, centers around the Dakota, which was built on the Upper West Side back when it was practically the wild, wild west. There (laughs) was nothing up there, which I actually, this is one of my cocktail party um, things to talk about now is because of your book. I'm like, did you know that when the Dakota was built, there was nothing else around it? (laughs) A lot of your books have a historical site at their center. Is What appeals to you about hanging your narrative on that kind of historical framework? You know, it started with the Barbizon Hotel for Women. Mm-hmm. And um, I think it comes from when I was a kid, and my parents both English, and we'd travel back to England and visit all the relatives who lived everywhere from the very south up to Scotland. So we spent a lot of time in the car. And to keep me and my brother from killing each other, We would stop at castles and manor houses and take tours and explore. And so to me, the history of a place became really exciting. And the idea of, okay, who else walked down these halls 100 years ago? And I just love being able to ask that question and and then answer it. And there's so much history to explore. I mean, it's practically endless. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your research for these books and and especially the masterpiece. Yeah. So the masterpiece, I interviewed a lot of art historians, um, artists, that kind of thing, to really get a sense of of what that's like, because it's not something I'm familiar with. And that was a lot of fun. And for the the book that's set at the Dakota, um, again, it was just going through old books on the building, which are fascinating and talking to people who live there and getting tours of the building, which was so much fun. From the basement up to the attic, it was incredible. That's really cool. And then for the Barbizon Hotel, it was interviewing women who'd stayed there in the 50s and 60s and finding about their experiences. And I think as a journalist, to me, that's what brings a story to life, is really finding people to tell me their stories, which then, you know, become little parts of, of a, a, a work of fiction. I mean, and how far we've come that now, you know, it's not that long ago that these single working gals in the city had to stay in this, you know, hotel apartment building. They had a curfew. They had um, a chaperone, no men allowed. Really, we've, we've come a long way in uh, just about 60 years. Yeah, and I can't tell you how many women I interviewed who stayed there who said that staying at that hotel and, and having a place of refuge almost made them able to go out into the city and become, you know, bankers and journalists and actors and editors. And so it really gave them an anchor to forging a career where no one was forging a career. Oh, I love this. Well, I'm so excited to read the masterpiece. I know you guys are too. Okay, I know we're wrapping it up, but I have one more question before you go. (laughs) I can't help myself. Sure. 
Is there one piece of information or trivia that you found during your research for the masterpiece that was most surprising to you or something that now, like Abby, you're going to use it as your cocktail party fodder? (laughs) What a good question. I think with what I learned about Grand Central, it really was about this art school that existed there because no one knows that. It's yeah. called the Grand Central School of Art. And and it was fabulous. And these amazing faculty members worked there. And so for the first time in this book, I base two characters on two actual artists inspired by. And so just learning about their lives. And the key thing is this woman who worked there. Her name was Helen Dryden. And no one's heard of her. She did all the Vogue covers in the 1920s, these beautiful illustrations of women with long necks and all curves. And she was considered the highest paid female artist in the United States in the 1930s. She did ads for Studebaker cars. She did interiors. She did industrial design of cars. She became this really, she did costumes and sets for Broadway, and then she disappeared. And you never hear from her again until 1956 when there's an article in the New York Times about this woman who's living in this SRO drab hotel and was surrounded by stacks of magazines from when she was famous and said she'd fallen on hard times. She'd suffered a personal tragedy and could no longer work. And she ended up in a mental asylum. And so that to me, I thought this is an amazing woman who should be known. Um, And so the character is loosely based on her, but there's a lot there to play with. Wow. And I feel like Grand Central as a building just is mysterious and around every corner there's secret passageways (laughs) and, and isn't the clock at the top of the info center, isn't that mother of pearl? Um, I learned that somewhere, maybe. Yeah, Um, they say it's... um, yeah, they, that's what the the rumor the is. The rumor, yes. exactly. Yes. Yeah. yeah, to to and stave even off learning things thieves. like the clock on the outside on the south facade, at the very top, you can go up there and open the number six, and look out. I'm adding another one to the TBR pile. There yeah, and the bucket list. I want to go open the six. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Fiona. I can't wait for this. It's coming in August from Dutton, and we're so excited. Now it's time for You've Got to Read This, a segment where we invite a friend, a coworker, an author in to tell us what we've got to read. So, Fiona, tell us, we're dying to know, from your reading list to ours, what do we have to read? All right. Well, there are two books that I have absolutely adored recently. And the first one is The Story of Arthur True Love by Elizabeth Berg. That's a definite read-it-forward favorite. (laughs) I have not read this one yet, so I'm dying to hear about it. Well, it's the story of this um, elderly widower named Arthur Truelove who encounters an 18-year-old troubled teenager. And what's so wonderful is the book isn't set anywhere specific. It really feels like it could be like an English village or a Midwestern town. And so there's this real universal feel to it. And then on top of that, each character is so vulnerable. She really makes you root for them to succeed. Even the, like the irritating neighbor across the street is rendered so perfectly. And you just want them all to be okay and to do well. It's about people who feel very isolated but kind of find a solace in community. And it's just beautifully written. I didn't want it to end. Where did you first pick it up? Well, you know, I heard about it on the Today Show, actually, because Harlan Coben was listing his top Christmas books. And, and I thought, oh, that sounds good. And it was, it was right up my alley. I love that. And I feel like a lot of times, especially what I personally read, is so dark that it's nice to kind of have a, a palate cleanser <laughs> that's yes. more of a gentle, uplifting book, a book where you don't have to, you know, set it down and be like, I got to take a break for a little while. It's yeah. more like, oh, I'd like, I'd like some more of this, please. Yes, it's a book sorbet. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Okay, so what else do we have to read? The other book I just finished was Amy Bloom's latest book. It's called White Houses. 
And it's about the real-life love affair between this reporter named Lorena Hickok, who's known as Hicks, and Eleanor Roosevelt. And so it's a true story. So you, you kind of know the basics and you think, okay, I know what this is about going in. But she does something interesting where she doesn't tell it in chronological order. Each scene jumps around a little bit. And so it's like this jigsaw puzzle of these scenic gems that, you know, they all start coming together. And, and by the end, you have this really rounded picture of these two women and their struggles and their love for each other. Oh. It's beautiful. The last chapter is just heartbreaking. I love that. What drew you to this book? Would you say, you know, you're an Eleanor Roosevelt fan or an Amy Bloom fan, or did you pick it up on a whim? Like, what what sparked your interest? That's a good question. I'm definitely an Amy Bloom fan. As am I. Yes. <laughs> and and she just did so much historical research. So as a, a historical, you know, fiction writer, uh, I'm always curious to see how someone else approaches it. And it's so in-depth. It's It's incredible the way she worked what really happened and created these scenes um, that are you know fictional but it's just beautiful and I think what links both books is that they're both about mature people who have complicated pasts and there's something really refreshing in that as well books about real life adults (laughs) yes exactly life doesn't end after 45 (laughs) as these protagonists uh, show us obviously (laughs) exactly it just gets better Well, thank you so much, Fiona. I am definitely going to add these to my summer reading list. Yeah, one of the downsides of this segment is that we're going to be crushed under a pile of books because we're convinced every time. You're right. I've got to read this. (laughs) 